Oh, I think we got uh, Rick Flair on. Rick, how you doing? I'm fine, Dave. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. Thanks for coming on again. Um, I, we're, told you, I, would, I apologize for having me heard it last night. So I want to make it up to you tonight, man. I was going pretty good last night, I think, huh? Yeah, you were doing really good. We were getting like, uh, every, every phone line was lit. We were getting emails like crazy. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, great. Uh, there was some... Uh, let me really get through this. Let's see, what do I have? Oh, you know, um, I have a whole list of questions. I never even got to ask hardly any of them yesterday. The first time that, that a lot of people outside of the Carolinas, and, and I guess AWA, got to see you regularly, was um, was on the uh, the Superstation, yeah. um, Channel 17. Before it was TBS, it was WTCG out of Atlanta. Um, on the uh, Saturday Saturday and Sunday shows, uh, you would come down to the Carolinas. Um, it seemed like about once a month. Yeah. About, about right? You weren't there like yeah. every week. I started in 78, yeah. Harley Ray yeah. told me. Harley was traveling to the Carolinas. He said, uh, you know, Harley said, kid, if you want to you want to get a jump on it, try and get yourself on that show in Atlanta. He didn't even know what it was back then, you know. He said, it's going to be the, it's going to be the thing that changes our business. Said, Harley told me that back in 19, probably must have been 77. Okay, because that was exactly what I was going to ask you is, you were on there, and, and it, it gave, you know, basically the nation, as far as the number of people who had cable TV, which is a fraction of what it is today, but it was still, you know, they were seeing wrestling from out of their territory, which was unusual at the time, and, and you were one of the stars of the show. I was wondering, since you were one of the few guys who was coming from another territory to be there fairly often, I mean, did you, when that happened, did you know you were on the ground floor of something really huge, or was it just you were booked in Atlanta, so you went to Atlanta? No, actually, it wasn't. What happened was, is uh, I think that was, was Crockett's way of trying to get me some exposure, hoping that they were going to be able to get. You know, the, when the Crockett, when when Jim Crockett's father died, uh, Jim Crockett Senior, he, they lost all their stroke in the NWA. Not because of uh, lack of uh, position with the company, but because of the fact that Jim Crockett Senior was like. Eddie Graham or Fritz von Erich or Bob Geiger or Jim Barnett or Vince uh, McMahon Sr. He was one of the older established guys, and when he when he died, the company you know came into the hands of Jimmy Crockett, and nobody knew who Jimmy was. You know, henceforth he lost the, the stroke or the I guess what I'm trying to say the, the power that they had you know in terms of trying to get a champion out of that territory. And everybody of course everybody wanted to have the champion come out of their territory, especially with, uh, with the power that Eddie Graham had in Florida and Fritz von Erich had and Bob Geigel, they really had control of the NWA. So what happened was Barnett came up to, to meet with Jim Crockett and, and seen me a couple of times. Jim Barnett, who at that time was running that TV and was a, you know, one of the most powerful guys in our industry, not only in America, but over in Australia. So he saw me, he's the one that brought me down. And I think uh, Jim Barnett has had as much to do with me getting the title or getting my first title in 81 is probably Jim Crockett. I mean, Jimmy pushed me, but... Jim was the guy that brought me down and featured me on that TV with, you know, Ole Anderson's booking at that time, but they're the ones that used me. And uh, it was, I, I had no idea. The guys that were on that TV back then, when we went to Ohio or wherever we went, it was out of Georgia. Uh, it was it was huge. I mean, like, we were like, you know, like, like, rock, like rock and roll stars, especially Tommy Rich. And Tommy Rich was over at that period of time as, as good as anybody ever in the business, in, in, a, in, a, in a smaller market, of course. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't don't remember that one. You know, one of the guys also that you worked with in that period that I that I remember in the very early days of, of Superstation Wrestling, Georgia Championship Wrestling, was Tony Atlas. So I guess yeah. Tony probably came down from the Carolinas too at that point, right? Well, he had already left the Carolinas. He, he, oh, okay. he actually he's from Roanoke, Virginia, and Ole and Gene broke him in in Charlotte, and he spent about maybe two years in the Carolinas, and somehow you know there was a, like a reciprocal agreement between Crockett and uh, Jim Barnett at that time, and. Uh, they wanted another guy uh, to come down into that Atlanta market, you know, a black guy that, because they had, you know, they had a huge uh, uh, demographic uh, uh, that, that followed the uh, the black guys. And if I know Patterson at that time was trying to put himself in a position not to be pushed anymore, and they brought Tony in, and then he got over huge in the Atlanta market. And of course, he got he got over huge wherever he went. He was he was a, another guy that potentially should have been one of the big big players for a long time, but. You know, let us twist some problems, uh, overwhelm them, and consequently, you know, it's it's the story is <laughs> it's not a good story. You know, it just it's, yeah. uh, it, it, uh, it has ended, not ended yet, but it, he has not obviously seen what he should have seen in the industry. Yeah, he had he was he was very very big for for a period of time there. You know, one of one of the things with Tony Atlas because the first matches I saw of Tony Atlas were against you, and I guess it was it's kind of a funny story now because. Um, 
at that time, we all thought, man, this Tony Atlas, what a phenomenal worker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He, he, he could press land me and give me the two flex of his belt. But he, he tried hard. Tony, you know what? He was a good amateur wrestler in high school. And he had good athletic ability. We just, you know, the guy that, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the compliments, and we worked hard with those guys. You know, there were a lot of them in the business that have come through here, you know, last 20 years, and we worked hard with them. But, it, you know, and I appreciate the compliments from you, but it took a lot of guys like myself and Arn Anderson and uh, Tully Blanchard, Ole, G, and the guys that were, you know, that were built to help make other people look good. That's what we did, you know. And uh, Tony, was, Tony was very receptive and a very nice guy, and always showed me a lot of respect, so I had no problem, you know, helping him. Did, uh, I, I guess I guess in his day, I mean, he must have been like a, a real powerhouse in mean, some of the lists he did. I mean, he's still kind of like... I mean, age group wise, I think probably one of the stronger guys in the country. So oh, let me say that. He, uh, Dino Bravo, you know, uh, who is, we all know, is a real strong guy and a real nice guy, by the way. Uh, Dino and Tony were in Charlotte at the same time, and Bravo was tremendously strong for those who didn't know that. And I saw them in the gym one day. I saw Tony do eight reps of 505, and I saw. Yeah, you know Bravo would do 12 or 505 in the band. Really? Well, I've never seen that in my life. And I see yeah. a strong guy. Same, same day. Yeah, they're both. And this is, this is 1978 or 79. Bravo was a horse. Bravo could bench for 600 pounds. Yeah. Was, they they did a gimmick horse. with him, you know, trying to do, like, whatever, 700, which at that point was was a gimmick. Yeah. But I mean, I remember, like, people were going, like, uh, you know, um, oh, that was, like, all fake. And I go, yeah, but the guys are, you know, he can really bench, like, over five, like, you know, anyway. No, I, I, I saw him do 580. I can't say I was on the 600, but I was, you know, in my estimation, you could call uh, Dino Bravo a 600 venture. Wow. Uh, Tony Atlas, for those that don't know what I'm talking about, you will be, he took a, a close group. It was almost like a tricep press for him. If he had ever learned to bench with his chest instead of the triceps, Tony probably would have benched, you know, who knows what. He had about an 8, maybe an 8 to 10 inch grip, I mean, from hand to hand. He wouldn't go wide. Or, you know, the big guys always, the big bench pressers are always, with a wide grip, sure. Tony was all triceps, but he man, he could just, just blow that thing off his chest. They had a yeah. bench press contest between he and uh, Bob Backlund in Atlanta, probably in about 1979. Bob Backlund was another guy who could bench press 500 pounds. Yeah, which people I'm sure now don't realize. You know, like uh, yeah. Bob Backlund was never, certainly after the 80s, was never like thought of as a power guy. But I mean, I remember him in the late 70s, and he he was a powerhouse. Oh, it's tremendous. I mean, guys look at Bob and say, God, how can you do it? But Bob's a bench press 500 pounds. And they did, keep in mind, they did it in a ring, you know, which had some spring to it. So it was, yeah. it, they did it in Atlanta several times. Bob was a real powerful. Tom, Rick, you know, we got, uh, we actually have listeners, like, all over the world. This is actually, this email came in from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, it says, Rick, I'm in New Zealand. I've been a fan of yours for years. I've always wondered the reason for your dropping the title, the WWF title, to Bret Hart at a house show. Um, actually, I think that was a TV taping, but it didn't air on television. What were the reasons for the title change? Uh, you know, not taped, not airing on television as a Hart versus Flair world title match on television or pay per view would have been a classic. Um, you know what was behind that? I can't answer that question other than the fact that I was just uh, told to do it. Yeah, and, and uh, that's what they wanted at that time. I think if they came back from Europe, they rethought uh, what was going on in the business, and. Uh, I, I really don't know. I can't answer that question. I, I, I know I got the call. I was actually in Los Angeles, and we did it in Calgary, his hometown. Oh, uh, Saskatoon, maybe. Was it Saskatoon? Okay. I think it was, Sas it was somewhere up there. I don't think it was Calgary, but it was somewhere in that area. Well, it was near. His whole, his whole family came, and I don't know why. They didn't make a big deal out of it. It was just a two-day decision, and they did it. And, uh, you know, I, didn't, I had no problem with it. I, uh, as a matter of fact, I had just come back. Uh, I don't know, you remember when I had the inner ear deal? Yeah, you had the vertigo thing? Yeah, I had the inner ear thing, and I had that, and I still wasn't over that. And I don't know whether that was, you know, influenced the decision to, to uh, do it or not, but uh, at that point, I did it that day, and I, and I ended up being off for about five months. Remember that? Yeah. As a result of that thing. So, uh, uh, I, I don't know, it was just one of those things that uh, they made up their mind. They probably had a booking meeting and said, you know, we need to... You know, make some changes here because Hulk had left at that point. Uh, Roddy had left, and I'm not sure whether they were trying to build a new uh, a new baby face or exactly what they were doing. But that was it. Just came down that day. You know. Yeah, I know uh, that um, um, Warrior Warrior and uh, Davy Boy Smith had both been fired like uh, you know just a couple of weeks earlier, and I think they were like exactly. the, the top main eventing baby face. So I think that they 
just felt that, you know, they needed a top baby face and they needed him in a hurry. Yeah, exactly. And then they, they picked Brett. You know, I, I got a funny story about that one. And that is um, when, when Brett got the word about that, which was, um, you know, probably just a few days before it happened. This isn't like Evie. I, I don't know how many days ahead of time. And maybe at some point, you know, he'll tell the story. But he was brought into a meeting, I think it was with McMahon and, and Patterson, and they just went to him and they just go, you know, we've decided we have to go in a new direction. And he's just sitting there. And, you know, he was doing pretty well. He'd been Intercontinental Champion. And he just goes, oh, my God, they're going to fire me. And instead they told him he was going to get the title. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a nice guy. I get along real well with Brett. And I have no problem thinking that he probably was a little surprised because I... I don't When I went up there, he was just, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like what you would call mid-card. He was an intercontinental champion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he wasn't some main event in that, but uh, he'd been in that role for a long time. You know, and I, 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 you know, I got along with him very well. And, uh, you know, I actually, when I worked, uh, when I had the title and he was challenging me, we worked a little bit around the country, we drew, we drew real well together like that. And, uh, you know, when we, when we switched it around, I think it, uh, you know, it, it didn't have, have the same interest level that it did with him chasing me. So, but we we had a good time, and uh, I should, you know, I spent a lot of time with Brett on a European tour right before that happened, and uh, you know, we got along very well. So I, you know, I had no problem doing it, and I think that uh, it was a, a big deal for him that night. His whole family came. I just wish it could have been, you know, on a more on a more grandiose level, like you said earlier. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we've got, uh, let's go to the phones, we've got Todd from Illinois. Todd, you're on the air with the only person ever in the history of this business to have a three-star match with the Giant Gonzalez. That, and I, believe it or not, that was going to be one of my first statements. That, that, that's when you know Rick is uh, larger than life, when he can uh, have a good match with El Gigante in Chicago in front of a thousand. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, the reason I'm calling, uh, I had the privilege of... Uh, I was talking to Terry Funk for about an entire evening about pro wrestling one night, and I found out that he wasn't the fondest of Rick, um, based on some happenings in based on some happenings in 1989. Uh, as far as he said that he was kind of unaware about the retirement angle um, that was going to take place, and I know Rick was in charge of the booking at that time, and he said that Jim Ross and uh, Rick were pretty much trying to run him out of the NWA, and I'm wondering if I can get the other side of the story on right, that. Yes, that's, I'm glad you asked that question. That's, I'm, I'm glad that that has come up. Are you asking, you're asking me or Dave? I'm asking you, Rick. Yeah, that's, just, that's entirely untrue. That was, and if Jim Ross can hear me, that was entirely a Jim Ross, Jim Hurd production. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was not in charge of booking at that time. And, then, and we went to Memphis. Uh, that thing was not Memphis, Nashville which is where Terry, uh, this was where came back. after the match, yeah, I had no idea. You're talking about the I Quit thing in New York, right? The I Quit match in New York, yeah. yeah. Right. No, I had no idea. I was not in charge of uh, booking at that time. And uh, uh, that's exactly about the point in time that Jim Hurd and myself and Jim Ross completely went sideways with each other because he wanted me to cut my hair. You know, I don't know, Dave, you know more of the story probably than I do, but they were huge. And Terry Funk to this day, and I, you know, I was watching him. I guess it was just been less than a year ago. But WWF is one of the guys that I have actually have found not only to be one of the great wrestlers of our generation, but one of the most entertaining guys in the business. So that's not true. And uh, gosh, I've been around Terry several times since. And I, if he said that to you, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that because that was never. I would never have wanted to retire Terry Funk in any capacity. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't more in a degrading way. I always I asked the question of why he uh, called it quits in '89 when it seemed he was uh, to a point where he was on top, and he just brought up that point. Yeah, I know what happened, and, and I, I I pushed him when I was booking in '95, and by as far as the company would let me, because you know Terry wanted to do at that time doing the moon salt and the garbage can and all that stuff was all ECW stuff, and we were producing a show in in, in Disney and. Uh, you know, Eric was Eric was all over me about Terry doing that. But Terry come to me and say, I, and I, I didn't mind because I found Terry to be Terry. Terry is Terry Funk. I mean, he's a classic. He's a legend, and he's a guy that, uh, in my mind, will always go down as one of the greatest guys, one of the greatest performers in our business. You know, that was just a, in 1995. I had the book in terms of quote unquote the book, but I didn't have any say so. And that's just that's the way to put it. Oh, it's good to hear the second side of that. Yeah, yeah, I think I think if, if, if Terry feels that way, he's never told me that. 
we just, you know, in 95, we were just trying to put everything together. We had just gotten Hogan to come into the company, and uh, Jimmy Hart came with, with, with Hogan. I have a lot of respect for Jimmy. But the, the whole company was basically trying to restructure itself. Or Eric was trying to restructure the whole company on a lot on a, on a lot smaller budget than they have now to work with. And uh, they were trying to, to actually rally around the Hulk Hogan image. And, and the Hulk wanted, of course, to have these guys around him. And that's basically the story. That's it will always go down like that. So we were moving guys around as fast probably as we ever have, just trying to make give him a level of comfort. And he wanted, of course, to surround himself with guys that had been with him in the WWF. All right, and my last question. Out of uh, since you've been on top and been the heavyweight champion, who would you say in the ring treated you, uh, I guess I want to say, with the least amount of respect? Was it a shooter, you know, in the ring like Brody or... Uh, a uh, young guy that was just coming up that thought, thought he was on top, and does anybody come to mind? I, I've never had that experience. I've never, somebody, anybody, okay. I've, never, I've never worked with anybody that didn't, didn't show me the respect of who I am in the ring. Well, that, I think that's a tribute to you more than anything yeah, else. No, actually, Brody and I, uh, <laughs> Brody and I, and I wrestled Brody, this is, and Dave knows where I'm coming from, in St. Louis one night in front of the biggest crowd in the history of the town at that time. In front of Japan, Japanese TV for an hour. Yeah, and, that, uh, the hour match. I remember. Yeah, I remember was, seeing and, and he was a he was a big, big card in in St. Louis. Uh, he was right there with Dick Cabruz, and that's pain. Uh, uh, the big accomplishment I can. God rest his soul, because he was a huge card there. But those guys, you know, it's funny because they never they knew the word. I think the word was with me in the industry was that I was there to make the match, never to make myself. And if a guy gave me a good match, I could make myself. If that makes sense to you. If a guy allowed me, if they gave me the time, and if a guy had confidence in me, which almost of the top guys did, I could get myself over just by being in the ring of the guy. I could lose every night, but I could be, if, if I had 50 minutes or 35 minutes to lose, the people went home saying, God, that guy got beat, but Christ, you know, in my mind, they went home saying, you know, what a, what a tremendous performer he is. That's, and that's kind of how I analyzed my whole career. So Brody, I had a great time with Brody. I, I can't remember ever, I, I can't say I had great matches all the time with guys, but I don't think I ever had a problem. I kind of think you're asking a question, you're kind of catching me on guard, but I don't think I ever had that problem. I can't remember ever having it. Never right, had well, a guy. Well, thanks for your time, Dave, thanks for having me on. Oh, no problem. You know, Rick, I, you know, one, of the, one of the things, uh, was, was that the most frustrating period of your career working for Jim Hurd, or was it, were there other, or was it like the last couple of years? Like under Eric, uh, more they, they, frustrating. They were, they were they were they were equal. I remember Jim Ross saying one night, and I, I don't think Jim had really else, but he said that uh, he said, "Rick, you're going to be 39 years old." <laughs> I agree. Yeah, we got, we have we have to do something with you. You know, you're 39. I remember, I remember this. This was uh, this would have been uh, probably right around December 1989. Okay, there was probably a Christmas show in Atlanta, and I. I I was not there for the conversation, but some friends of mine were and called me like that night, and we were we were laughing. Except it was not it, it was it was serious. Yeah. And uh, you were just you know in '89 you had just finished the program with uh, Steamboat and then with Funk, and they were unbelievable matches. You know some of the best matches of your career, some of the best matches you've ever seen. And at the end of the year, you know they were just you know WCW had its ups and its downs. Um, you know, but they were they did not make money that year. And the whole thing was is you know we're going to turn this company around. We just have to replace Blair as champion. And we were just like, don't they understand that, that that's the one thing about the company that's working is the main event? No. But the they, problem was that, you know, in those days, there was no undercard. It was a one-match show. Well, I shouldn't say no undercard, but, but uh, you know, so the lot of the undercard wasn't, wasn't so strong in, the, in, the, in that period. Yeah, but see what you're, what you're saying, Dave, is true because the bad fan, as is now, or should be as is now, the guy that's wearing the title... They look to him as being the guy that is responsible for making the show or the company or the revenue work, you know. And that's not one of the territory. I understood that. But, see, I wasn't given an opportunity. When when Turner took over the company, um, it wasn't wrestling as we knew it. That was the first initial change. I mean, it wasn't where I'd go into a building and you would say, well, here's a guy we built for a year to wrestle a champion, and if you're over the champion, we're going to draw a big house. It was... Now it was like work inside this enclosed environment, take care of yourself, which was hard to do, but build A, X, you know, A, Y, you know, A, B, C, D, whatever I'm saying. 
make these guys look like, you know, they're ready to be challengers to your title, or better yet, let's just redo the whole thing. You know, you cut your hair, and her wanted me to cut my hair, get a earring. <laughs> I remember Kevin Sullivan looked at him one day and said, you know, why don't we just change Mickey Mantle's number? <laughs> I mean, the truth story was that and it's mean I, I was flabbergasted the stuff that came up with and I knew, I knew Jim Ross and like everybody else this business because of its because of its nature and its design and because it is the most uh, what's, I've already, I've said, most insensitive business in the world you know Jim was looking for a job too he wanted to, you know, he wanted to be in, in her gear and Jim, and Jim was and so Jim you know took advantage of that me I wanted to get out of there as fast as I could you know, I didn't have any social time with Jim Hurt at all. And he was there, and, uh, you know, I mean, history, history will tell the story. It's yeah. one of those things that, uh, as someone said to me today, he said, you've tried, you've been there. I was going to say it on TV when they decided not to, but I've been there through five or six different <laughs> bosses in 10 years. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you've, except for the period where you were with McMahon for that couple year period. Yeah. Or, I, you've I, been there since the day one of, day one of the whole company. Yeah, and I came back and I was with Bill for a month where he cut fires, you know. Right. That's something I've, I've, seen, I've seen it all. I, I was going to use that as a promo one night on TV that I've, I've been there. <laughs> to see five guys in Kevin Gold, but I didn't think it was in good taste. In the 1970s, I think about 75, 76. Uh, you were in, just as your career was taking off, you were in a, a plane plane crash. Yes. Uh, that was a plane crash that ended the career of Johnny Valentine, as a matter of fact. Yes, I did. And Bob Brothers. And Bob Brothers. Um, and um, uh, the question is, how long did it take you to get back on an airplane after that? Um, actually, I think I told you, Dave, I got back on an airplane in, gosh, February. I, got, I crashed in October and got back on an airplane in February. Um, it started up in the outer course on a 747. <laughs> but, kind of, actually, what they did the first time, they rented a you know, full-blown Big Ten jet back in that time, you know, which was a very nice airplane, it's probably a Lear 9 or something like that. And then as I gradually gained some confidence, I got to say, because we were doing those double shots all the time, which required the, the airplane, required the transportation of an airplane. So... I started me out on a big plane, and after about a month, they came down and finally left back right back on the same kind of plane I crashed in within about two months. So, actually, I was on an airplane in six months, to answer your question. Did you, um, what was, what was your feeling, you know, up there when, I mean, did you, did you know something was bad, or, or what, what happened exactly on that, no, on that plane crash? You, well, it's funny, you know, I'm the guy, actually, I, I, I can't take credit for, uh, any more than the fact that I recruited the kid. His name was Michael Farkas. And he, you know, as you know, he died a year after the accident. But I met Michael, and I just, I would just, you know, at that point in time, I was tired of driving 2,000 miles a week. I said, gosh, you know, I've only been doing this a year, but, or actually about a year and a half. I just don't think it's what I want to do the rest of my life. I love wrestling, but it's got to be an easier way to get around. And, you know, sure enough, I could, you know, at that, back at that point in time, you could take a plane like this. It was a six-passenger plane. We flew it all over, we flew it all over the southeast, you know. For five hundred dollars a day, it was unbelievable. So you know, when I say the six guys, you know, Valentine, Wahoo, Paul Jones, were all flying in it. And that, on that particular day, it happened to be Valentine, myself, uh, Bob Brothers, uh, Jimmy Crockett, who was supposed to be there, ended up not going to St. David. You know, and for David, uh, much to David's misfortune, and then Tim Woods. And uh, what happened was that we found out later, of course, in court that the guy didn't have a license. He'd already he'd moved here from Colorado. And they suspended his license there. had no license here. And uh, what he did to carry the, the kind of weight that the plane was carrying at that time, which we didn't know, was, which was way over gross, he was carrying, you know, you know, limited, limited fuel. And apparently we hit a headwind. We were flying from Charlotte to Wilmington, North Carolina. And at about Raleigh, yeah, they, they, he was at what they call a point of no return. Either go back to Raleigh or go to Wilmington or be here in the middle. And uh, instead of going back to Raleigh, which he probably should have done, he tried to buck the headwind and make it into Wilmington. And Valentine kept pointing up to the fuel gauges, which were empty, you know, and going, you know, it only Johnny could go. <laughs> but he was kidding me, but he was kidding himself, you know. It made us all very nervous, but the pilot had the headphones on, couldn't hear the communication between the tower and him, and all of a sudden the right engine went off, and when it did, it didn't, it didn't just, you know, it didn't just spin around, it just went dead, it pinned, and uh, he reached down to pull for the reserve tanks, when he hit the reserve tanks, he wasn't carrying the fuel, the left engine went out, and 
we were at about 5,000 feet, we just went straight down. We were 1,400 pounds over gross. Oh, which, was, which was reported in court, you know. So was that, was that like the longest moments of your life? You know what? I don't remember anything except uh, getting on the ambulance. You know, the guy was loading us on the ambulance, and the only reason we didn't we weren't we were on all dead is because there was no fuel on the plane uh, to burn. So when we hit the ground, we actually were going so fast that instead of when we went to the treetops, not only the treetops of a plane that size of a cartwheel of a plane. We were going so fast, we broke through everything, and uh, we hit a rail, rail, railroad thing. We were going 220 miles an hour. That's what was pinned on the uh, on the dashboard. And uh, one thing I remember is they loaded us on the ambulance, and the guy said, "Yeah, we're going to lose this one." I thought he was talking about me. He was actually talking about Bob Ruggers for going in a shock, you know. So you know, I just have a very limited memory of it all. I don't even remember going down, but I, I knew that when that engine went off and the other one went down, we were in trouble, and I. For some reason, that's been blocked off. Probably, probably for a number of good reasons. <laughs> it was a really, a really a bad deal. But I remember Wild with McDaniel's, and uh, this is a great story too. That it should be, it should be told, and if we told right now, Wahoo was wrestling at night. Back we were selling out everywhere back then. Wahoo was my opponent, was the first guy at the hospital. And of course, they wanted to keep Wahoo out of the hospital. I thought he was coming in there to beat me up. This is a, this is how you know <laughs> the business was back then. You know, Wahoo came. Plus, in the emergency room, they said, are you okay? All that. I mean, the nurses and the doctors, everybody was in shock because everything was kayfabe. And I'll tell you what, they had, a, they had a, an eighty or $90,000 house in Greensboro the next night. The only thing that saved the territory is Tim, Tim Woods agreed to go into the ring, you know, because of, to this day, you know, if you could find people, and it's a very limited audience, but to this day, people don't know that Tim Woods was on that plane. He walked out of the hospital. Mm-hmm. Because it was so cafe back then, Jim Woods and Valentine entered into, oh. entered into a real heavy program. Right, 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 right. Because Tim Woods was, was babyface, and the rest of you guys were healed. Exactly, and, and Valentine was like his adversary then. And you know, they, the Crockett said, "God, you need to do me a favor, walk into the ring." You know, that, you know, so they don't think you were on an airplane. You know, because the word was getting around, and back then it was so cafe. Nobody, nobody, the people would have been astonished. I think that Mr. Wrestling was on that plane with, with us. And so yeah, Tim did the business and did the, the Crockett's a huge favor. And wow. as usual, didn't get, didn't get anything back for it. So. <laughs> wow. Let's go to Ed in New York. Ed, are you there? Yeah, Dave, how you doing? I'm doing pretty uh, good. I just got a Ricky, excuse me if I uh, mark out a little bit here. I can't hear him, Dave. can't believe I'm uh, actually speaking uh, to you. Ed, talk a little louder. Okay, uh, Rick. Um, yes. A couple people I was curious to hear your, your opinion on. I know uh, Bill Watts. Uh, I can't hear him at all, Dave. Oh, oh, he's asking for your opinion about Bill Watts. Uh, I know a lot uh, of people, they, uh, you know, either you love him or you hate him, and I was just wondering what Rick Flair's opinion of him was. Well, exactly what I said last night when you were asking about Bill Watts. Uh, I judge everybody in this business I have over the years. I've learned how they treat me and Bill Watts for some reason. Uh, I'm being honest to talk about people treated me tremendously. He paid me uh, the, the correct percentage when I went and worked for him, which was unheard of. Um, and uh, when I came to Atlanta, he treated me like who I am. And that's probably because in 1972, when he came to Minneapolis, Vern Guinness sent me to pick him up and I carried his bags from the airport into my car, drove him down to the building, carried his bags in the building. That's probably, <laughs> it probably rolled over. But Bill treated me great. And I see Bill uh, periodically now because my son wrestles. And my, my youngest one, an amateur wrestler, and I take him to the Tulsa Nationals, which is a real tough national tournament every year. So Bill always comes out to see him, and he's always very respectful of me, and I've gotten along great with him. I've never had any kind of uh, any kind of bad dealings with Bill, other than the fact that every time I went out there, he wanted me to wrestle Butch Reed or Jake or somebody for an hour every day, <laughs> which he never did himself. <laughs> but other than that, I have no problem with Bill Watts. Uh, let's go to David in Arizona. Dave, are you there? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to uh, bring up some of the great matches Rick had. Uh, I was thinking, I mean, yeah, uh, when I was, uh, after that uh, Horseman return, I made a bunch of uh, compilation tapes of Flair matches in the original Horseman. And I mean, he had a, he had a tremendous match with Bret Hart in uh, Boston. It was like a, it was a marathon match for an hour. Yeah, an hour. And then uh, a few matches with Barry Windham, which I think uh, should have won the uh, Observer match of the year in 87. Uh, that you're seeing in Baltimore? The, 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 the TV match? Yeah, the one the one in the Crockett Cup was just... Oh, that was a hell of a match with the Crockett Cup in Baltimore, right. Yeah. And then the one in North Carolina. Uh, but one of the uh, matches I 
didn't even when I was going through my tape, all my uh, TV tapes. I had a ma- I have a match with you against Shawn Michaels. Yes. I was. I mean, your. I mean, Bret Hart was a five star match, but that was just kind of a disappointment. If you would have known that Michaels would have gone on to be the uh, legend that he is, I mean, do you wish that you would have worked with him more? And are you glad that you got to work with him as much as you did? Well, we only had we had here's the funny story with a TV match. We had like eight minutes. Right. There was no way. I did. One of one of the things that I would love to tell everybody tomorrow is that Shawn Michaels is going to come back to wrestle me in New York. Mm-hmm. Or wrestle me in Char- I mean, wrestle me in Atlanta, wherever it would be. I would love to wrestle Shawn Michaels. I think that he has said the same thing about me. If I thought I could wrestle Shawn Michaels for 30 minutes on either one of our programs, whether it be New York or or, or Atlanta show, you know, where I, that's where I work now, I would uh, I would invest a bunch of time to make my self right for that moment. I mean, I to me he is he is a tremendous tremendous performer and, and, and a gentleman. I, I mean, I have a lot of time and a lot of respect for Shawn Michaels. But that the time you're talking about, we were in Corpus Christi, Texas. And they came up to me and said, you got eight minutes of Shawn Michaels. I mean, it was, it was, there was nothing to do. They just can't have a match between two guys like he and I. And uh, he has a lot of respect for me, which I, which I, in turn, have respect for him. But he, he's a guy that can wrestle. He's a guy that can do phenomenal things, which I could have never done. Uh, I can't say I could. I think of that. I'm not saying I couldn't have done them. I didn't. I wasn't trained to do moon salts off ropes and stuff like that. Um, uh, had I taken the time to do that, I'm sure I could have done that too. I'm not limiting myself, but he's a guy that was just a tremendous athlete and a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous technician and a guy that really loved our business. Because to be as good as he got to be, you have to really have respect and love for our business. Uh, yeah, when I saw that match, I think it was like in my like December '92 tapes. It was like right before his uh, right before he, his heel turn. I mean, I, I when I like caught that match on tape, I well, I just sure started dying like the he was, Marty Jannetty, and he was just he was just in a tag match situation, and they at that point in time hadn't figured out who the guy was. I mean, he's just a tremendous performer. Rick, did you ever get to watch the the Rockers Brainbusters? Any of those matches? Oh yeah, Arn Ar- 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 Tully against the, the Rockers. Yeah, they had some great matches in that era. Arn makes him watch them. <laughs> yeah, they did. They had tremendous matches. But it was, that was wrestling. See, the um, what Shawn Michaels was was a was a was a well built, you know, handsome, handsomer than handsome Ricky Morton. I mean, Ricky Morton could work his ass off, and Shawn Michaels came along in the same. I mean, Shawn had the same kind of appeal, and uh, but he actually was even a, you know I'm not saying that a better worker. Yeah, he was. He was a better performer than the Ricky Morton even at that time. Of course. He he became probably the best performer in our business. I really did. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to fight myself. I think that there's aspects of our business that I'm better, better at than he is. And uh, but I cannot say that Shawn Michaels was not is not one of the greatest born of the king. Yeah, he, yeah he's I, I think he's, he's way out. When, there. He, when he was on, when he was on. He was about as good as anyone. Yeah, he, he's, he's way out. There. I really have a lot of respect for him. And I think I've said that to a lot of people. He he's right there. He he was not only because of what he could do, but because of the attitude. Attitude is a lot in, in life. I mean, it really is. I mean, everything we see from Nike on down is attitude. But he really had a good attitude, and he loved the business. He could have wrestled an hour every night too. I mean, he could. He loved. He loved being out there. Okay, uh, let's go. Let's go to a John in New York. John, are you there? Rick, how you doing? Good. Uh, I got a quick question for you. How close were you to jumping to uh, Titan back at WrestleMania 7 with Hogan at the LA Coliseum? With Hogan in 1991? Is that the year you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was already there. Can you hear me? Or? I, I, was, I was at Titan then when that happened. Uh, I was at WrestleMania 7. No, no, no. You, you, you would have started with Titan about three months after that? Is that no, 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 no. You would have started, uh, yeah, I think you started in September of 91. Right, he said September 91, so this is like March of 91. Yeah. I remember there was a rumbling like a few weeks before WrestleMania that year that you were supposed to come in. I I had been ready to go for two years. I had an opportunity to go in 86 and passed it up. A huge opportunity and passed it up because I really didn't know that much about the structure of of the difference between our company and theirs. Um, But I could see that that, that Dusty and Jimmy Crocker were putting together something that did not include me. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, I I was having such a good time. But my problem is, and you know, Dave has been out with me socially, and that is that the business has always been 
and always go away from me. You know, I, I will never let it get to that. I mean, athletics, you know, stressed me out before. I'll always remember more good than I will bad. I mean, I, there is so much good that came of this business for me. And I've, I've enjoyed it. I've learned from it. I've prospered from it. And uh, I, mean, I want, that's my problem. I always want to give back to it. It's not a problem. It's just something, it's the way I am. And, and back then, I didn't know the difference. I mean, I, as I told Dave last night, I knew that Hogan was there and Savage and DBS. Those guys are just contemporaries of mine. I mean, I'm, I was happy that Ted DBS was doing well. I was happy that Piper was. Didn't know Hogan well enough to care whether he was doing well or not, but I knew that he was. But I looked at myself and I looked around me and I saw, gosh, the, the best, best performers of business are right here. I didn't, I didn't even think about WWF. So um, I really didn't think about going until well, you're talking about the year. And then when I saw that I was not getting my due, which I very rarely have asked for, I wanted to go real bad. So to answer your question, uh, I can't remember just how badly I wanted to go, but I did want to go earlier than I did. Yeah. I was talking to someone in Minnesota a few weeks back, and they mentioned I used to be one of the Vashon paper boys. Well, what? You were a paper boy for one of the Vashons? Yeah, so Mad Dog, my, Mad Dog and Paul. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I was yeah. talking to him. He was like, you know, because he lived down the street from the one of the Shans. Yeah, and he died. They lived both of them in the apartment complex next to my parents. Oh, my That's God. Parents That's incredible. Right home. Yeah, I was right there. Mad Dog. And don't kid, let me just break this down for you. In our business, there have been three or four guys that have thought they're tough, but they will love this. Haku, to this day, is the man. And I'll back that with anybody that wants to argue that's the case. But when I started in the business, Mad Dog was Sean was and probably is even on one leg still the man. <laughs> and Maurice was Sean was a very, very tough person. <laughs> and a good amateur wrestler on a forty eight team for Canada. But he was also a very, 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 very tough guy. Very dangerous guy. Oh, and he wasn't even, and he really wasn't that big of a guy either. No, he was about two hundred and twenty pounds, which was real big for him, but he was he had a heart that weighed about 180 pounds. <laughs> he, Dave, he, he, I put him in the same class with uh, Haiku. Dave, this is cool to have Rick Flair on your show after a month of being on. Is there any chance to have an 18 page interview of, uh, with you and uh, Flair uh, in, the, in the newsletter anytime soon? That's coming up next, but we can't give that away, right, Dave? Special <laughs> subscription. I'm crazy yeah, Rick, to see that in, in, in writing. You know, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a five hour special. <laughs> There was a, there was a, you know, with Mick Foley's book on the bestseller list and everything, is there, has anyone talked to you about, you know, like, as far as, like, doing a book? I mean, Dynamite Kid just, I was, I was actually today reading Dynamite Kid's autobiography just came out on Monday, and it's, yeah. it's pretty good reading, too. Mick Foley's is, you know, is, is, is uh, kind of a classic book already. <laughs> well, it's funny, I've been, you know, I've been approached two or three times, my wife's walking up to me right now, Dave, so I can't tell the truth, but I'll have, <laughs> I'll have to write my book. My book will be much more exciting than theirs. <laughs> you know that, right, Dave? If you tell all, it will be. <laughs> Dave, Dave, she said, "Give me a diggy." She said, "Tell Dave I love him. Send me, the, send me the tape that he owes me, and I, he owes me the original, not the bogus one." <laughs> and I've got to go have dinner with her. So, uh, to answer your question, I'd love to write a book, but Dave, you and I have to discuss that behind closed doors. We'll find the right guy. Right? I thought Mark Madden probably did the guy to write it. But we'll have to edit, you know, make it right. But it'll be a much more interesting book than this small wrestling. Yeah. As you know. Yeah. The four horse more real. <laughs> <laughs> Can I close by saying goodbye, Dave? Okay, sure. Go ahead. I, I have to. And tell the, the gentleman out there to ask that question. And when we write the book, it'll be a bestseller for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Okay, thanks so much, Rick. Hey, Dave, thank you. Call me tomorrow, okay? Okay, we'll talk soon. Those things have gone well, and I really appreciate you guys featuring me, and I appreciate all the nice compliments and all the nice things you've all said. And, I, and Dave, to you personally, I hope everybody can know this, I've always appreciated and always well the recognition. It really is nice. Well, you're, you're very welcome, and, you know, you've worked, as you. hard, for it. You've worked hard for it, and you've, everything that you've gotten you've deserved, and everyone knows that. Thank you, sir, very much. Okay. God bless you, Dave. Okay, thank you very Bye. much. Bye.